Assalamu alaikum. Hi there, everybody. My name is Idris Watts, and today I'm going to speak about the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system, what we mean by that is our parts of our body that runs automatically, i.e., we have no control over it, um, or we don't um, consciously manipulate it and have any control over it. It's just running in the background as if and we don't usually have to be concerned about it. That would be things like heart rate, our breathing, our digestion, our blood flow, etc. Now obviously um, it's not fully uh, completely automa automatic because we can have some control over our nervous system specifically you know most commonly we'd refer to our breathing using different breathing techniques we can actually regulate our heart rate for example but in terms of our nervous system we have two um, categories or two sections which we call the parasympathetic and the sympathetic now sympathetic means um, sympathy emotions um, and the how it means almost to be to gather together so this strong sort of activation that's gathered together in order to mobilize us to action that's what we, we refer to and mean when we talk about the sympathetic and then the parasympathetic means that which is um, opposite to or near to um, so it's not about being mobilized it's not about being activated rather it's about being calm or we're going to see the other side of it where we're completely immobilized. So the parasympathetic um, the, is, is located here in the bottom of the, uh, the skull here and also down here, um, our pelvis, whilst the sympathetic runs throughout the, the back here, all the way from, from the top down to the bottom. And that obviously is what mobilizes us, especially, you know, up here in the our higher rib cage. It like mobilizes us to action. There's this spurt of neurochemicals that also um, that brings us into mobilizes us to action. So as I was saying, the parasympathetic, it has one branch here and it has one branch here down the pelvis. And the sympathetic, so the parasympathetic here, this parasympathetic here and the sympathetic in the middle. This is why if you think about it, when someone's stressed, what do we do? We put our hand on their back and by doing that, it actually soothes the sympathetic by rubbing someone's back or holding their back. Um, it soothes them. Also, you'll notice when someone's stressed, they might do this and they place their hands behind their neck and place them on the bottom of their skull because that induces again a parasympathetic feeling whereby I feel almost calm come back into my system. So we naturally do these things without any thought. Um, we access these points, but it really helps to be conscious of them whilst we're doing them so that we can really bring ourselves um, more consciously in and out of these states. So let's recap. So the parasympathetic has two branches, one at the top, one at the bottom, the sympathetic through the middle. So the parasympathetic, the one, um, the one that uh, we're going to look at first, is what's commonly known as rest and digest, or in polyvagal theory, the ventral vagal. The ventral vagal is the social engagement piece. And it's when we're feeling almost connected, engaged, um, relaxed, at ease in ourselves. And if we want an easy way to look at it is like if you imagine the green light on the traffic light. When the green light on the traffic light is engaged, the car's moving. We're in flow, we're in connection to the other cars around us, and we're moving towards our goal. This will be we we notice this in terms of facially, where our facial muscles will be quite vit um, have a lot of vitality to them. We feel engaged with them. We engage this uh, part of under the nervous system and we're encouraging this in infants when we do peekaboo. Peekaboo is stimulating the muscles of the face so that the, we can um, encourage this growth in the child. Um, the eyes, for example, will, will be small. They won't be dilated, they'll be very small. Um, our muscles, as I said, will be engaged and vital, there'll be some vitality and movement to the muscles in our face. Um, our attention 
will be almost relaxed. We're taking in things and it's not an effort for us. Um, and so this is what we refer to the ventral vagal or the green light on the traffic um, light. Then we have the sympathetic. The sympathetic is what we, we can look at as amber on the traffic light. This is the fight and flight. The first one was rest and digest. The next one is fight and flight. The fight and flight is, if you think about amber, what's amber do? Suddenly, oh my goodness me, I've got to, I'm called to action. There's some spurt of neurochemicals in terms of um, and cortisol or adrenaline, and there I am. I've got, what have I got to do now? Um, do I stop? Can I get through there before it turns to red? So this is now we're activated. Here we're in, uh, we've got, we're in activation, we, emotion, we want to do something. And it's very sort of, it's non, it's, it's, it's not very, you know, the prefrontal cortex, a part of our brain that's function, that um, deals with thought and thinking, that's not engaged now. We're almost in automatic the way that we respond. So if there's a fire in the house, if there's, you know, there's some sort of person um, almost going to have an accident, we engage almost automatically. So this is the sympathetic, the activated state. Our pupils will completely dilate, we become sweaty. Um, our focus will be incredibly tense. Um, so this is the sympathetic. And then the last one is the other side of the parasympathetic, which we call dorsal vagal. And this is freeze, immobilized, and then eventually collapse. So this is, again, this is another state of us where we almost, this is the red on the traffic light, we're shut down. We don't, we're, our face um, becomes completely flat. Uh, we zone out. Uh, a sort of a minor uh, exa example of this would be almost just a little bit of disassociation. I we're drifting off and we, we're, we're not really connected to the environment around us. And so we can have very subtle um, uh, expressions of this where we feel almost not with it, just a little bit zoning out because we're just a bit, a bit overstimulated so that we can almost go away and then come back. And then we've got the extreme of it um, in a coma where someone completely collapses and shuts down. So that's the dorsal vagal. And that's what we're, the, the, the nerves around there are located right low here in the pelvis area. Now, so we're, we're constantly going through these three different states throughout the day. You know, when a child, a child has dorsal vagal, it shuts and freezes, and it has activation when it's upset. It doesn't really have the parasympathetic, isn't really come online fully. And that's the role of the, the caretaker, the mother and the father, the parent, is they are trying to stimulate the, par the eventual vagal um, in the child so that it can learn to almost, um, through time, regulate itself. A child can't regulate itself. And we, we, we educate that child through our interactions with it, how to bring that online. So for example, the child is lying there, mother and father engaging it, it feels really good. The mother and father walk away, uh, leave the room, and the baby's sitting there, okay, and then all of a sudden it starts to become aware that it's alone, and it starts to feel uncomfortable, and starts to cry. The mother hears that, and she runs back into the room and she uses many different devices in order to almost bring that child back into parasympathetic. How does she do that? She uses prosody, a voice tone, uh, in soft ways, maybe a high tone but soft. How are you doing? You know, here you go. And they ho she holds a child, so that's the second one, so it feels the contact. And what will happen to the mother or the caregiver or anyone taking care of the child is its nervous system will automatically go into that parasympathetic state because it realizes that this nervous system needs my attention. So you'll notice that you can feel a bit down, a bit um, not with it, and then a child or an animal walks into the room and you suddenly become alive because you realize your nervous system realizes it needs to attend to that. So we engage with that through prosody, through voice tone, 
we would do that through obviously through singing and humming that stimulates this ventral vagal um, this parasympathetic state um, we do it through um, our facial contact so them seeing our eyes and connecting in a soft way these are all different ways that our nervous systems feel that everything's okay and they calm down the problem is is that what happens is that if we haven't managed to develop how to come out of activation or how to come out of shutdown in an effective way growing up uh, circumstances didn't provide the, the you know um, enough opportunities for us to learn how to to ingrain that habit of um, us as being able to come out ourselves into this more um, relaxed state then we get stuck we get stuck between sympathetic and shutdown sympathetic and shutdown and we rarely experience that social engagement or because we rarely experienced it at an early, at an early age when we do come um, uh, encounter it what happens is is that it's overstimulating for us so we become activated so do you realize the dilemma that some people's nervous systems can have if they never really had ample opportunity to engage with the social engagement system and thus they get stuck in these states of activation and shutdown activation and shutdown so in therapy it's almost um, one of the roles of the therapist is how to help that person engage with the parasympathetic the ventral vagal part of the parasympathetic in ways that feel okay and safe and learning how to feel almost I can feel safe I can let go I don't have to hold on or, I, or collapse all the time I can come into that social engagement and it be safe and especially if people have been through real abuse where they, um, where social engagement has felt very threatening that's a real struggle for people and hence why often people are encouraged to um, have uh, therapy with animals like horses and dogs because they feel a bit more safer with those um, organisms until they can feel that social engagement in themselves and thus they're able to uh, go into the world and engage with humans um, in a manner that they feel um, they're able to manage the activation in their own nervous system. If we struggle to be able to regulate ourselves because our caregivers weren't able to give that to us in an effective way, what happens is we start to almost, as we grow up, try to calm ourselves through uh, different ways. And that can be through some people because they're always stuck in activating or shut, activation or shutdown, they may almost they may eat in order to calm themselves down. They may uh, play computer games in order to calm down. They may turn to pornography or smoking or sleeping or whatever in order to calm themselves down. But what we fundamentally need for us in order to come into the sympathetic, the higher level of our sympathetic, as parasympathetic, sorry, the ventral vagal, is social engagement. Um, to be with another that holds us and we feel safe in, um, in their company and we feel that they are able to almost um, make us feel safe we come out and as we do that more and more and more we're able actually to do that ourselves um, if we don't learn to do that this is where addictions develop and maladaptive behaviours that don't serve us in the long run if you think about in nature um, animals they have the ventral vagal they're socially engaged there's a deer being socially engaging with his group, feeling relaxed, and then all of a sudden they hear a rustle in the bushes, and out comes a tiger. They suddenly, what they do is they orient, so they will hear something, usually first, then they will orient towards a danger, and then they're going to alert. If they realise, actually it's not a tiger, it's just something that is... Um, non-threatening they will come back and settle the nervous system so they went into activation the sympathetic and then they were able to go back into the parasympathetic easily then they hear it again they're going to alert again they hear they orient and their muscles become tense and then all of a sudden they do see the tiger and they go into full flight so they're running they're in sympathetic they're immobilized their muscles uh, there's a lot of energy surging through their, their body and then what happens interestingly if the tiger managed to catch one of the animals what eventually happens is it will go into the freeze response the dorsal vagal the other side of the parasympathetic 
what this uh, looks like is they just completely can become immobile and freeze and this is a protective part of our nervous systems in order for a number of things endorphins are uh, released in the uh, nervous system in order to so it doesn't feel any pain so if it is killed it's going to feel less pain as it's as it dies another wisdom is is that the predator usually um, loses interest in an animal that suddenly freezes less likely to start because it needs the sort of motion of the the prey in order to stimulate its aggression and so when it actually freezes often the predator can become um, uh, lack interest in the animal and walk away the animal then is able to spring out of that immobilization it's not done consciously it just suddenly it's an autonomic response it comes out and it can escape and also they think it they may think it is dead and so they go to get their pups and as they go get their pups the animal springs out and escapes so it moves out of the parasympathetic or the dorsal vagal part of the parasympathetic that shut down the mobilization um, it goes into sympathetic at this alert and then runs and then it shakes off the energy because if you think about it it mobilized all that energy and then suddenly it stopped just like a bike going down a hill at full pelt you imagine the pedals going round and round and round and round really fast and then it hits the wall um, even though the bike stops the pedals are still going round so even though the animals stop there's all this mobilized energy internally and that means that it has to release that energy. So when it comes out of the, the dorsal vagal shutdown or immobilized state, it um, will shake and shiver or run in order to release all that um, energy that was compressed in the nervous system. And then it feels okay again. This is what happens in the wild. So it's a protective response and they're all needed, these different parts of the nervous system. But the sympathetic the activation, the fight and flight, mobilization and the, the dorsal vagal part of the parasympathetic they're supposed to be just temporary states that we touch into um, but if they start to get st we get stuck in them that's when all sorts of problems start to happen and we start to um, feel pain we start to feel not not ourselves we start to feel a bit fragmented and then if that prolongs even longer and we, we struggle to move into the the higher um, uh, higher stage or level of our nervous system, the ventral vagal, um, it can cause all sorts of problems for us. The key is to learn how to take ourselves through those states, sometimes through with the help of others, sometimes by ourselves. And as we learn to do it through others, over time we learn to be able to do it ourselves. And that's, um, there's many ways we can do that. What's also important for us to recognize is that the way we feel about ourselves um, expresses how we, uh, where we are on the rung of the, the hierarchical ladder of the nervous system. So someone may say, for example, um, I really just don't want to deal with anything. I just want to be by myself. Um, I just want to zone out. What part of our nervous system is that? That's the red. That's the, that's the dorsal vagal shutdown of the, um, or immobilized response from, on, on the part of the parasympathetic. Then someone may say, he's really irritating me. I just want to get out of here and I want to, you know, and I, I just want those people to stop talking and let's just get on with things. That person's activated, so they're in sympathetic. Then someone may say, do you know what? Yeah, I, it's not as bad as I was making it out to be. I feel all right about the matter now um, and I feel like I can engage with people again. He's in green because he's now come out of the activation or he's, and he's come out of the shutdown and he's ready to engage again. So we will see the way people express themselves throughout the day will tell us where they are on the, on the, on the hierarchical ladder of the nervous system. So that's a very useful tool to ask ourselves through the day where are we on the hierarchical ladder. So you almost think, what's my attitude? What's my feeling about myself? And what's my feeling about the world around me and the way that I connect to it? Now, it's not that um, any one of these parts of our nervous system are bad and others are good. We need them all. But the sympathetic and the dorsal vagal, the shutdown, we don't want to stay stuck in those. If we stay stuck in those over time, it can cause all sorts of damage, but we need them. Sometimes we need to almost wipe, uh, we need to zone out 
If we've had an accident, we need to recover. Um, if we're exhausted and overworked ourselves, we need to recover and we will want to shut down. But it's just like noticing when we feel ready to re-engage, it's really important just to note that when we almost feel a little bit more available to the world, that's how we work with these two systems so that we're ready to come back into the social engaged Another part. Important piece is one of the fundamental parts of our anatomy that enables us to move through these states is what we call the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in our body. It connects our brain stem all the way down to our gut and connecting all our different viscera. If you, um, if you imagine like a plant, it's got all these roots going through the soil. That's like all the different parts of the um, the, the, the vagus nerve, how it connects to all the different um, uh, uh, the different parts of our anatomy. So the vagus nerve, its role is it detects um, are we okay, are we not okay, are we okay, are we not okay. It's just constantly checking um, wh whether we can relax or not. And 80% 80, 80 of the nerve fibers send a signal to the brain that things are okay. And then 20% of them send us a, a signal from the brain to the viscera that everything's okay. So our, our, our viscera has a far greater influence on our brain than our brain does on the viscera. So, we, you know, someone may try to almost talk themselves out of an issue. That has some impact, but it's far more effective for us to almost s send a stimulus to our viscera so that our viscera can relax and then that makes our brain relax. So a, a simple way to do this is what we call is by uh, the VU in somatic experiencing is to send a signal, a vibrational signal down the vagus nerve, which is called the wandering nerve. That's what the vagus means um, because it travels throughout the body. Is to send a signal down into the gut um, through the vagus nerve, and then we start to feel we come out of the activation or we come out of the shutdown and we move into the parasympathetic, uh, the part of the parasympathetic, which is the social engagement part, which is the green light, the ventral vagal. And we do it like this. So we take a, we just wait for a natural inhalation to come in. We feel it come in, fill up belly and fill up our chest. And then we release. <sighs> Do one more round. And then we just check out how we're doing, what happens. So when I do that, I just feel this almost drop a little bit. I feel a little bit of buzzing in my arms and my stomach just feels it's relaxed a little bit more into my pelvis. And my breathing just feels a little bit more settled. My eyes, the muscles around my eyes don't feel so intense. And my attention just feels like it's softened rather than it being a bit more intense as I'm looking at the camera. So this is what we call the VU. And most spiritual traditions have uh, a practice that's based around this. So in the Hindu and Buddhist tradition, you have the OM. Um, in the Islamic tradition, we have Allah. It also remind, reminds me of the um, the didgeridoo amongst the Aborigines in Australia. That sound, we're sending that sound into our gut, but it's not just about doing the exercise. It's about actually sitting with it, and um, and then what we notice next as we do it after we've done it. And we do this with children, we sing lullabies, and um, it's even more powerful when we do it collectively, because when we do it collectively, we're engaging that social engagement piece, so it takes us out of the shutdown, or it calms down the activation and brings us back into um, social engagement. What happen is, if someone um, starts to feel activation, they will feel the activation rise, and then they will start to panic, and when they panic, it starts to almost spiral into a next wave and then the next wave and what we want to do is we want to almost learn how to when we feel a spike of activation work with it and use it but then when we feel that it's too much we almost feel a come down so we can feel a little bit of settling and so it starts to feel like a regular wave 
what can happen for people is they feel that spike and they go into another spiral and another spiral and another spiral and then what eventually happens is, is that the parasympathetic says my nervous system can't take this anymore so it, the parasympathetic will rise and then it will almost clamp down on the sympathetic and pull the nervous system, shut the nervous system down. So there'll be all this um, energy that's, that stays dormant in the nervous system and we're in this freeze response which can feel very frightening. And also what will happen is that if that stays prolonged like that, all sorts of problems can happen and it's a very dangerous state to stay stuck in. That's not to say that the dorsal vagal is always just about shutdown. It's about us almost giving up. But that giving up can be a, uh, an uncomfortable giving up, that immobilized freeze, but it also can be a pleasurable. So if we have a bath, for example, and we just almost surrender, and we feel ourselves just go, or after some rigorous exercise, we can feel that. After sexual relations, so there is the dorsal vagals is about a set a state where almost we give up but that giving up can be comfortable or uncomfortable it's very important that we recognize it's not always just about being in discomfort the dorsal vagal that shutdown can actually be a very pleasurable because you're almost submitting to something and that can be um, that can induce some very spiritual experiences as well but the thing is that we always have to eventually come out of it that's the most important thing to recognize and be able to move back and forth between these, these states. So as I stress, they're all needed, but they're not supposed to be, um, we're not supposed to be constantly stuck in one state. So I hope that was helpful. And if you have any questions, you're most welcome to put some comment in the, any comment in the box in the YouTube video, or to email me at awidrisuk at gmail.com. So thank you very much, everyone. I look forward to engaging with you in another video. Um, in the foreseeable future. Assalamu alaikum, take care.